This is the part one video podcast for chapter 16 about groundwater measurement. Groundwater plays a very important role in the hydrological cycle and is something that we in a modern society are drawing on a lot. So it's really important to understand groundwater and how we can make measurements to characterize how it's changing through time. So just some basic definitions, groundwater is the liquid water that completely fills pores in sediments and rocks. And we can see in this illustration off to the right, the blue here is illustrating groundwater, um, the saturated subsurface. And we can define the water table as conceptually sort of like where that water transitions, but it's not a fine line. And so instead we define that on a pressure basis to be where the water pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure. And when we get into Vedo's zone hydrology later in the quarter, you'll see why we make that nuance. It's not like it's dry above and wet below. Um, there's always moisture in the Vedo zone. And so therefore, it's... <clears throat> okay, so there's three parts to this chapter. I'm going to break this up into three video podcasts. It just seems like a clean way to do this one. The first one is going to deal with hydraulic head as a concept, especially as it applies in wells. Uh, we'll have definitions and concepts and then the field methods. <clears throat> and then part two will be about aquifers and their characterization. And part three will deal with groundwater flux measurements and how to do model calibration with field data collection for that. <clears throat> So, as I was saying, we have the Vedo zone. The Vedo zone is the area where the pores in the soil are unsaturated. So there's still water present, and that's why the water table isn't easily defined as like dry versus wet. But it is the, the water table is the zone below which um, the, uh, the ground is saturated. So that's, that's the, the, the groundwater. Okay, so we have this kind of concept called hydraulic head. And already, of course, we've made a term that, that seems more complex than it has to be. Head, head effectively is, where is this water table located? However, it's not just the water table, because as you'll see later on, we have areas that are under enormous pressures that can have significantly higher um, pressures in the water than just what would be reflected in the water table above that. And so we have the idea of head, and it consists of two parts. Uh, recognizing that the water is moving very, very slowly through the ground, it's very close to what we call hydrostatic pressure, which means that we're not interested in the part of um, a pressure that's existing in the subsurface associated with the velocity of the water. So the head here is denoted as some elevation because head has units of length. So we're going to be some height above the ground, well, okay, relative to the ground. And we typically have a datum that we use called sea level. So if we did define that as zero and we're using a geodetic datum like, you know, a national geodetic vertical datum or North American vertical datum or something like that, then we can define the elevation up to the bottom of the well as Z, um, which is this height shown for this little sketch that I've drawn. And the head is the combination of Z plus the water pressure that's in the well. And the water pressure is characterized by the height of the well if you're in an unconfined aquifer as shown here. And so here we have um, the height of water in the well is the water pressure divided by the specific gravity, which is given in units of density of water times gravity. So H is head. Z is our, our datum essentially, or height above the datum. Uh, and then P over gamma is our pressure. So pressure is units of force per you know, unit area, like you know, newtons per square meter. Um, and so if we have that over a specific area, then we can get it into a, a pressure. Um, but if we can also convert it to be a head by dividing it by the specific gravity, and that ends up with a, a length scale uh, units of length. So the variables here are water pressure, elevation, density, and gravitational constant. So it's a relatively simple thing to do, and therefore the field measurements for this are straightforward, but we just have to be mindful about how we do that. 
So here's now a sketch where this rectangle is a well, and I've drawn a blue fill pattern in the area where there's water. We could define the area where the water surface is as, of course, the water surface or water surface elevation. And then above that, this solid line denotes the ground surface. So if we would like to know what is the water surface elevation, again, we have to have some kind of datum in a geographic coordinate system. It can't just be, you know, it can't just be um, how far is it below the ground surface because the ground surface itself is undulating from mountains and lowlands and things like that. So um, we can use uh, RTK GPS, for example, to survey in the vertical coordinate at the ground surface adjacent to a well. Then we can measure this distance A, which is the height from the ground surface to the top of the well. And then we need some kind of technology that's gonna measure the distance from the, the lip of the well down to the water surface. We'll call that D. It's not the depth in the water, it's the depth in the air to the water surface in the well. So the water surface elevation is the ground elevation plus the height that the well is above that minus the depth, and that brings us right to this water surface elevation. The water surface elevation in and of itself is a hydraulic head for an unconfined aquifer. So one of the things that I'd like you to be able to do associated with these is to um, you know, let's say you were to measure those heads and you had those water surface elevations and they're shown here. So for each dot there is a value. The value represents the water surface elevation. What you could do now is you could make a contour map that shows the gradient in the, um, the hydraulic head across the land. So what I'd like you to do, and I've, I've already started this for you, is print out this slide and I've put this, I've made this available to you and then I'd like you to draw lines in here um, of equal intervals. I'd like you to have a line for um, the 10 foot contour, the 15 foot contour, and the 20 foot contour. So draw the contour lines for hydraulic head. It's the same process you would use for the elevation if this was the ground surface but when we did contour maps earlier in the quarter, I didn't have you actually draw a contour map. I just had you interpret one. And now I want you to take the effort to learn how to draw that. So this is going to be due. So I'll talk more about that in class, but definitely print this out and go ahead and draw those contours. How do you measure the depth to water? So remember, we have to get this D. There are two basic techniques that you can use to do that and they both involve the same fundamental idea. You need to lower something down into the well until it hits the water, pull it back up, and measure the length of the, the string or cable or whatever to get down to the water surface. The problem is, how do you know when you hit the water? One way to do that is to take a steel tape. So this is a tape like the kind of tape measures we've been using in the field. Um, so maybe as like thick as, as, my, or as wide as my finger is across, um, but then very, very thin. And what these are steel tapes, so you then lower that down. They're graduated just like a, any, any um, you know, uh, length measuring tape. Um, but what you do before you lower it down is you take the bottom most section of it, like the bottom three to five feet, and you chalk it up with a blue chalk. Then when you lower it down, you know, hopefully you know roughly where it is. If you don't, you'll have to do it incrementally. But lower it down until you think that it's in the water somewhere in there, and then pull it back up. And you'll have, of course, measure the, the, the distance from the lip. Okay, like right at the lip, when you put the tape over, see what is the reading on the tape. You know, 40 feet, 10 feet, whatever that reading is, right at the, the top of the well. Then when you pull it up, you'll have some of the tape wet. Let's say one foot of that is wet. Well, 40 feet of tape minus one foot wet means that the distance down to the water surface was 39 feet. So something like that. Um, this is a very simple technology. These can be very finely incremented. Steel tape is insensitive to some of the problems you could have with oil in a pumping well or something like that. Um, so it's a pretty accurate method. Um, if there's other sources of moisture in, inside the well that are going to make the, um, the carpenter's chalk get wet without actually hitting the water, 
you know, so condensation or something like that, then it's not going to work very well. Um, the technology that I see used more commonly today is called the electric probe. What this is, is a tape measure, much more like the kind that we use, usually some sort of plastic or fiberglass tape that's, that's also incremented along it very clearly and legibly. But then at the tip of it is a probe. And the purpose of this probe is to simply on off detect the presence of water. So as you're lowering it down the well, there's no water there. So you're just going to, you know, nothing's going to happen. As soon as you hit the water surface, you'll either see a light or hear a buzzer sound or some other uh, alert that will tell you that you've hit the water. Now what you're going to need to do, of course, this is kind of like with the Secchi disc, you've got to, you know, you'll have lowered it down too far. So you have to pull it back up just until it turns off, then like poke it down a hair, up, down, up, down, and kind of like dial in exactly where you think the water surface is. Then take the reading of that distance from the lip of the well down to the water surface using the, the numbers and, and lines on the tape. This is a, a very straightforward, easy uh, approach to use. It's more expensive than a steel tape, but you know, it's still very reasonable. It's, it's pretty standard. If you're again in a well that has any kind of oil floating at the surface, then you need to just have an instrument that can handle that. Same thing if it's a corrosive environment, whether that's salinity or other corrosive materials or, or chemicals, then you want to have approach to deal with that. One other thing, when you have a well that's already there, you may need to sample that groundwater. <clears throat> Earlier in the quarter, I showed you a peristaltic pump and how that works. Um, so a peristaltic pump, you'd be putting a hose down. The farther down you go, then the more, the stronger that pump needs to be to pump the water up to the surface. Another thing you could do is just take a, um, a cylinder that would fit into the well, um, make sure that the bottom is, you know, sealed, and then put the cylinder on a string, lower it down. So basically a bucket. I mean, what is a bucket? A bucket is cylinder with a closed bottom. So lower that down till it hits the, the water surface, you know, and, and if it has enough weight, it'll push through the water, fill that bucket and pull it up. And we, we just call that a, a well baler. Um, before you want to take a sample, remove at least three well volumes. So just pump out a lot of material, like pump the water out, let it refill, pump it out, refill, pump it out, refill. Now you can um, go ahead and collect your sample. Obviously, that's a lot easier to do with a peristaltic pump than with a hand baler. Um, of course, pour the water into the sample bottle without having contact between the baler and the bottle. So just very carefully pouring that in or if you're, or if you're using a peristaltic pump, you know, the, the hose that you have, don't put it in contact with the bottle if possible. Try to get it to overflow with one person causing the overflow while another person seals the lid to try to avoid air bubbles getting in, in there. And then it, depending on what you're doing, you're going to want to store it into a refrigerator as quickly as possible. Okay, so that's the end of, of part one, just dealing with hydraulic head and how to measure down to the water table.